Welcome to The Crossing Church. This is the version of The Crossing that goes where you go and delivers what you need. Fresh perspectives on faith and Jesus with practical, real-life next steps built in. This is your place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Now, in June 2005, Antonio Alves Reyes rented a house right next to the Central Bank of Brazil. Now, no one thought really much of it until on Monday, August 8th, when an unsuspecting bank manager walked into his bank vault and saw that $70 million was missing. You see, turns out that Antonio had planned one of the greatest thefts of all time. He and a few friends, three months from June to August, began digging this elaborate tunnel underneath the bank, connecting them to the bank vault, where on a weekend where the bank was totally empty, they broke in and stole $70 million. Now, instantly, this story became a national story. Police and detectives were blown away by the amount of time and planning and execution of this crime. In fact, numerous security experts were then interviewed on television over the following months. And many of these experts admitted that when a thief is as determined and crafty as Antonio is, there is very little you can do to stop them. Now, why am I sharing this story with you? It's because Jesus tells us that there is a thief that we face. In fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus tells his followers that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you have life, though, Jesus says, and that you may have it to the full. You see, this thief is known as the devil. And I know some of you right now are new to church and faith, and you're thinking to yourself, you're like, really, Andrew? Are you talking about the devil? Isn't the idea of the devil so, I don't know, old-fashioned? I mean, in our day, the only time you hear the devil talked about is in horror movies or maybe on the news when you hear someone say the words, oh, the devil made me do it. So if you are skeptical about the devil, that's fine. I am so glad that you are here and I want to encourage you to hang with me because according to Jesus, we have a real enemy who has a purpose, who has a singular goal, and it is to steal, kill, and destroy. You see, he is plotting to steal our joy, to kill our peace, and destroy any authentic happiness that comes our way. And I'll tell you, the way he will plot and plan, the way he will figure out a way to burrow deep inside of us, he will strike when we least expect it. In fact, in the book of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve, places them in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they have this perfect relationship with God until this enemy the thief, the tempter, the evil one, the devil, he comes. And with a few simple words, he destroys the lives of Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the servant was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You see, those little words, they wreck the confidence of Adam and Eve that they have in God. And within a few seconds, they replace Adam and Eve, they replace God at the center of their lives with this lie. Now, probably the best way I can illustrate this today is, if you remember that old movie, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there is this one scene where Indy is looking at this gold statue and he's got to grab it quickly. And it's priceless, it's gold, it's little. And so what he does is he grabs the statue and replaces in its place something that is worthless. He replaces it with a bag of rocks. You see, this is kind of what's happening in Genesis to Adam and Eve. You see, one move by this thief, and it destroys what's at the center of Adam and Eve's lives. This most precious thing gets replaced with something that ends up being worthless. And here's what I believe. I believe that right now, you and I have an enemy that is trying to weasel his way into our lives, to convince us to replace the source of all truth and joy and contentment with something that will turn out to be worthless. So here's where we're going to go today. Today, I want to unpack three lies we think, three lies that we are told will lead us to happiness. In fact, these three lies, they are all over our culture, all over our media. And these three temptations, we face them every single day. And they put our happiness 
at risk. In fact, these three lies are the very lies that the devil tries to use against Jesus. So today I want to unpack them for us because I believe they will give us a blueprint of how to lean in, listen to God, and move towards real, authentic happiness. So if you got a Bible nearby, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. And I always want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, this book, In the Name of Jesus, by the late Henry Nouwen, has had a huge impact to me and how I understand this passage. In fact, I would recommend any book by the late Henry Nouwen because he is one of my all-time favorite authors. Okay, with that, let's jump into Matthew chapter 4. It begins this way. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. See, what we see here is a period of temptation is coming to Jesus. Specifically, Jesus is going to be tempted to buy into a lie, a lie that his purpose, his happiness is found in something out there, outside of his relationship with God. So here we go. Verse 2, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he, this is Jesus, was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, this scene probably seems a little odd to us. So let me unpack what's going on here. Jesus is fasting. Now, fasting is the spiritual practice of choosing to stop eating for a period of time in order to increase our dependency on God. See, we deny ourselves physically to open ourselves up spiritually. So Jesus is denying himself physically. So from the very start, Jesus is hungry, like really hungry. I mean, think about the last time you were really hungry. For me, uh, I usually eat very little before I speak. So usually on Sundays by about 1 p.m., I am just starving. I mean, when I'm driving home from church, I'm usually, the only thing I can think about is usually all the things I want to eat that day. Tacos, pulled pork, and spicy chicken sandwich. And the list goes on and on and on. And I start seeing visions of all these things as I drive home. Now, that's me after not eating for like 12 hours. Jesus has been fasting from food for days. And it's at this point that the evil one, the devil, he shows up and he tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, don't forget you have the power to turn a stone into bread. Jesus, you have the power to make sure every want you have is filled. You see, this right here is the first great threat to our happiness. The first is the pursuit of pleasure. When I choose my wants, over God's will. You see, Jesus is in a place where he is seeking God's will. He's fasting. And the devil shows up and just says, hey, Jesus, maybe just take a minute and focus on your wants today. Now, again, there's, of course, nothing wrong with eating while hungry. There's nothing wrong even in wanting things. Uh, for example, my family growing up, we didn't have much money. So we didn't have the opportunity to go on vacation very often. So one of the priorities my wife and I have is that we carve out time and we save money every single year so that we can go on a couple of vacations with our kids. So we do things like go to Big Bear or Zion or last year my wife and I did a wine tasting in Napa. And we do these kind of things to have experiences traveling and spending time together and with our family. Now, this is a good thing. I also occasionally want things like deep dish pizza. That's another good thing. It's okay to want things. It's okay to get things. But here's where the danger comes in. The danger is when I prioritize my wants over God's will. Let me give you a few examples of how this can play out in churches. Uh, we're a church with a lot of young people who, many of which are brand new to faith. So one of the things that will happen around here is people will get invited here, they'll start coming, they start growing in their faith, they get really excited about God and Jesus, and over time they get into a group and maybe they meet someone who's cute and they start dating and they have this great relationship going and then this couple, they start hanging out more and they're growing in their faith more and maybe they even start reading the Bible together. And then what happens is this relationship, as they go on and progress, one of the things that happens is they begin to see that this theme in the Bible that exists that followers of Jesus wait until marriage to experience physical intimacy with each other. Now, this is, of course, not a popular message at all in our culture. And sometimes couples like this, they'll come and they'll meet with me and they'll be like, Andrew, how can the Bible tell us to wait? That is impossible. It's so old-fashioned, no one can do it. And what I try to explain to these couples is that this is a battle between what you want versus God's will. It's a battle of want versus God's will. You see, God's will for your life 
is that you fully commit to one person. That you are in a lifelong commitment where you are growing together in every area of your life. Where you get set up in a strong relationship that will last a lifetime. You see, God's focus, his will, is that we have a great relationship, not just today, but for our entire lives. But there's always going to be this fight between my wants and God's will. And so the question becomes, will I go after what I think will bring me pleasure today? Or will I wait on the promise God has for me tomorrow? My wants versus God's will. Or let me give you another, money. Now I know 99% of us would prefer to not talk about money. Let me let you in on a little secret. I don't really enjoy talking about money very often either. But because 30% of Jesus' words involved money, we have to talk about the things Jesus talked about here. So again, one of the things that will happen around here at this church is people will start reading the Bible and they'll see verses like this. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, the word tithe here means tenth. So, since the very beginning, followers of Jesus have believed that whatever we earn, 10% is given back to God. Now, often people will come across verses like this and they'll have a negative response to it because instantly they think this is impossible. No one could do that. Many of us think that, you know what, we live in Southern California where the Bible was written. They had no idea how expensive it would be to live out here today. We think that the people who wrote the Bible, they don't understand our economy or inflation or honestly, if you and I grab coffee, you might even say to me, Andrew, like this tithing thing, giving 10% of my money away to God, that is impossible. If I were to do that, I'd have to totally change how I look at and spend and view my money, which is exactly the point. Jesus talks about money so much because he knew that this would be a challenge for us. And this is the point, that there is a tension when it comes to my money between what I want versus God's will. And I just want to be super clear on it. God isn't trying to rob us of our joy. God isn't just interested in taking something we want. What God is interested in is our happiness. In fact, when you look at the things in our lives that cause the most stress, when many of us look at our greatest regrets in our lives, what areas do they revolve around? Often, it's our relationships and our money. You see, God is a perfect father who is trying to help us experience life the way he intended us to live. You see, God is for your happiness. He just knows. The pursuit of pleasure, choosing my wants over God's will, he knows it's not going to bring us the happiness we think. Okay? That's the first lie. We're going to keep moving here. Continuing in Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then the devil took him, this is Jesus again, to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. Now, again, this is a very odd scene, but here's what's going on. Why would the devil want Jesus to throw himself off the temple? So let's imagine the scene. You see, the temple was the most popular place in all of Israel. It was about 150 feet tall. So it's a pretty big building. If you've been on our campus, this is really like the ground to the top of our parking structure times three. So this is a tall building. So Satan takes Jesus to the very top and says, jump down, float safely to the ground. Let everyone see the miraculous powers you have. Now, what would happen today if someone were to do this? That person would instantly be famous. Their social media would blow up. They would be the most popular person around. Everyone would want to see that and hear that story. So Satan comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, do something that will make you instantly famous, instantly popular. Jesus, do something that will make you an influencer, that will gain a massive amount of followers. You see, the second lie that we are tempted to believe that will lead to our happiness is the pull of popularity. You see, when we think of popularity, often we think back to high school, the desire to be part of the in crowd or whatever certain crowd that may have been for you. But what was at the core of that desire? We all have this desire inside of us to be seen and to be liked. You see, that's the pull of social media, isn't it? We post something and we hope others will comment, others will like or love because we want to be seen. We want to be noticed. And when we get really honest, popularity isn't something that we just wanted in high school. It's something we all want now. And it's not a bad thing to want to be noticed. It's not a bad thing to want to be liked. But here's the temptation part. It's when I choose my influence over God's intent for my life. 
You see, the danger becomes when this desire for more popularity, more influence, when it begins to grow and consume our lives, when we live for likes and other people's applause. Let me give you an example from my own life. The Crossing is considered a fairly large church out there, which means working here and being the lead pastor here, it gives me a certain platform, a certain level of influence. Now, obviously, there are bigger churches and platforms out there, but I think you get what I'm saying. Now, oftentimes in the church world, people with a platform like this will look to expand it. They'll look to begin speaking at conferences or write a book or they'll start a church consulting firm. And I want to be clear, none of these are bad things. Consultants can be so helpful. And I go to conferences and I love reading books by church leaders and pastors. And every once in a while, people come to me and they'll be like, hey, Andrew, do you plan on writing a book? Or Andrew, why don't you speak at conferences at other places? Or Andrew, have you ever thought about doing consulting for other churches? And my response is honestly always the same. I always say no. And that's because years ago, God made it really clear his intent for my life. Here it is. And this is, again, just for me. God's intent for me is, one, love God first. Second, love and show up for my family. And third, love and serve the local church. And so what that means for me is the best of my energy, the best of my time, my best prayer lists, they all go towards my family and this church. So I don't speak at conferences or plan on taking three months off to write a book because I know all of those things, they would not be about God's intent for my life. They would all be about growing my influence. You see, I am focused on God's intent for my life. Now again, I want to say there's nothing wrong with pastors who do any of those things. I just know this isn't God's intent for my life. In fact, if you look at my social media, you'll see it's filled with pictures of my family and things about this church and Honestly, occasionally sports because I love sports, but I digress. You see, there is this pull in our culture today to go after platform, to go after popularity, to go after being liked. You see, we think the more other people like me, the more I'll probably then like myself, the happier I'll be. But the reality is happiness is only found in being who God intended you to be. Okay, one more temptation we're going to look at very quickly. Back to Matthew chapter 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. See, Satan takes Jesus to a mountain and says, look at all the kingdoms. Look at all the power available to you. All this, Satan says, I will give to you. You can rule over all these people, all these kingdoms. You see, here we reach the third temptation. The third and final lie we are tempted to believe that will lead to our happiness, it's the prestige of power. See, we look up to people with power. Look at the people we talk about every day in our culture. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Taylor Swift. I mean, her Eras Tour made $4.1 billion. That's with a B. On top of that, you cannot find an industry where people aren't talking about her in football, athletics, sports, money. I mean, she is by far one of the most powerful, successful people in our culture. And that's the goal, right? Every day we are told, be like these people. Get more, gain more, achieve more, earn more, rise to the top. In fact, power usually gets us those first two things we talked about, doesn't it? People with power usually have access to more pleasure, more money, more popularity. And again, power isn't a bad thing. People with power can shape culture, help alleviate pain and suffering. And we think to ourselves, if I could just be someone like one of those people, if I could just have more power, if I could just be more listened to at work, if I could just rise to a certain level of success, then I would be happy. And this leads to our third and final lie. I choose my ambition over God's authority. If I could just have the power and control I want, if I could just have the position at my job that I want, then I'd be happy. You see, we think power and happiness are so connected. And yet the message of Jesus has always been opposite. Jesus says about himself, he says, for the Son of Man, this is Jesus referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve. That while this world will tell us, gain plot power, climb the ladder, get control, Jesus has always taken a radically different approach. Jesus came to serve and not be served. You see, Jesus understood that happiness is found when we lean in on who God is, 
who he made us to be, and his role in the world and in our lives. In fact, Jesus' response to all three of these temptations that are thrown his way is this. See, the tempter comes to Jesus and tells him, pursue pleasure, Jesus. Prioritize your wants over all else. And look how Jesus responds. It says, Jesus answered, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, the devil then offers Jesus the pull of popularity, the great lie that our happiness is tied into our influence and popularity. And again, how does Jesus respond to Satan? It says Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then finally, the devil tempts Jesus with the great lie that the prestige of power will lead to our happiness that we should go after our ambition, our hunger for power. And again, Jesus responds to him. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Three times, Jesus responds to this great thief, this great deceiver with the phrase, It is written. See, what we learn from Jesus is that the author behind this book loves us and cares for us, that there is a God who made us and wants us to live a life full of joy and purpose and happiness. We find that there is a God who is with us. You see, all series, we've been coming back to this phrase, that happiness is less about what I have and more about who I'm becoming. And that is what we find in Jesus. So how I want to close our time online today is to give you an opportunity to receive the love and grace that this God offers. Let's pray. God, we come before you and we say thank you because you are such a good and gracious God that you meet us in this space. And God, give us the courage and power to turn to you when we are tempted by the great lies that come our way. We love you, God. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. This is a house of worship This is a place of praise Where every demon trembles Where we proclaim your name This is a house of healing Our hearts are full of faith You have our full attention You have the final say So come alive In the name of Jesus, come alive In the name of Jesus This is a house of miracles We bring everything to the feet of Jesus Everything in the name of Jesus This is a house of miracles There's resurrection power Your blood runs through our veins Your kingdom triumphs over Even the coldest grave Come alive in the name of Jesus Come alive Jesus.
Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus.